I may not have had anything for uh, yesterday's, which is still today, actually, because I did today's, yesterday's. Well, I'm doing to this one, which is the yesterday part of tomorrow's, which will be today by the time you see. You, you get the picture, right? This is still the same day when I had nothing to report yesterday, even though it's now today. So, um, but I got something. I got a book in the mail from Amazon, and this is going to be exciting. That's right, this book, which I'm never gonna be able to open while holding a camera, unless I put my knee on the table, which seems like kind of silly. I could fake this, but where is the, where is the drama in that? Hmm. Since the drama has run out. Hey, where else can you see somebody fight with a box live on video? And that is this book. These are the Voyages, the original series. Proper Trek. Season 1. Ooh, the expanded and revised edition. Even better. I have a feeling that this book is going to teach me far more than I want to know about the sexual proclivities of Gene Roddenberry, which is something, frankly, I really don't want to know. But, uh, but I do want to know everything there is to know about the making of Star Trek. And so that's why I have this book. And this will be an exciting thing for future. Uh, long, long camp board meeting. It's a board meeting for camp, not a board meeting that is camp, but it was a long, I just, I love, I love long telephone conferences. That's just, I live for those. Or not, as the case may be. Who knocked over all my Doctor, nobody knocked over my Doctor Who figures, darn it. Look at that, the, the fourth Doctor is falling over on the fifth Doctor, and the third Doctor is kicked in the second Doctor's butt, which is actually what he did when he came in. So yesterday, I got the book. The book. I told you about the book, right? These are the voyages. That's the book. 650 pages. The behind-the-scenes pot boiler that was the story creating Star Trek. Uh, it's kind of funny. I've always... Um, how do I want to put this? Kindly. I love Star Trek. Classic Star Trek. I like other Star Trek. I love classic Star Trek. I grew up on classic Star Trek. I, I shaped most of my moral values from Star Trek, um, which I didn't realize was a sort of a variation of humanism. Uh, but there you go. That was, that was what I grew up in. And, and you know, every episode of Star Trek, created by Gene Roddenberry in the beginning, which is very unusual for a TV show. Uh, it turns out it's a big ego thing. That's uh, from the book, thanks. When I was young, I looked at that and I thought, wow, you know, what, what, a, great, what a great man. And as I got older, I began to realize that the worst episodes of Star Trek were the ones written by Gene Roddenberry. And you'd see things in interviews, and you'd hear people talk about him, and it really, really very disillusioned with a man. Not nearly as bad as George Lucas, who obviously was just... <clears throat> Revenge of the Jedi, Return of the Jedi. Anyway, I don't But anyway, that, that neither here nor there. But the fact is, is that I fell out of admiration for Gene Roddenberry. Um, more felt, began to feel it was more a sense of, of luck, and in subsequent years, it was his sort of self-aggrandizement. Now, maybe it still is. I, I don't know. But what, I, what I'm learning here from this book, and I, I really have only gotten up to the part where they've kind of even sort of started casting the the Star Trek pilot, there was more to the man than I gave him credit. 
he, he was, it would appear, to be a believer in the ideals that he espoused. Um, he was an imperfect man, and, and while I was joking about learning more about his sexual proclivities than I ever wanted to, I have already learned far more than I ever wanted to know about what a television producer gets up to with the actresses that he's able to lord his power over. Uh, an imperfect man, no doubt, but a prolific writer and a writer that they kept coming back to time and time again. Whereas I look at the scripts that he's, his name is on in Star Trek and I just go like, those are just so bad. Those are the worst. And yet somehow he could do it. And he was clearly making scripts for people that liked them. He could get pilots made. He, he was able to work his way up to producer. So I, I'm, I'm gaining some of that respect back for him. And what's really the most important thing, and so far anyway, and what people have praised him on, was that Star Trek was well realized from the very beginning. Oh, we can argue about when the Prime Directive came in or when the United Federation of Planets was created, but as a world that was fully realized, he created one that where phasers and tricorders were items you don't even mention. They're just part of the tools that they use. And the example he used in a book, or in the book that, that he's quoted as saying, is that when a cowboy in a Western, 100 years ago, back in those days, pulled out his gun, he didn't have to explain to anybody else what a gun was. You wouldn't do it. And that was one of the things that Star Trek had going for it, was that the, the technology was part of the everyday life. It was not, as you would see, even in Doctor Who, where they have to have the companion to go, well, what is that, Doctor? Well, this is a retrofabric contrabill. They didn't do that. They simply used the technology and went on. And, and upon reflection, that was a, quite a feat in that day and age. It had not really been done before. And so I, I'm, I'm, we'll see. We'll see how this goes uh, as it goes on, because I, I, I'm still convinced that he was his own worst enemy in many cases. But that was um, what I've gotten so far out of. Another plug. These are the voyages by some guy. <laughs> okay, it's not much of a plug. It's by um, Mark Cushman with a C. Mark with a C, not Cushman with a C. Well, actually, Cushman has a C, too. It's not Cushman with a K, and it's not Mark with a K. It's neither Mark with a K nor Cushman with a K. Yeah. That thought kind of rambled off, didn't it? As you may recall from yesterday's episode, I spent the entire day trying to get my iMac working, installed in Yosemite. And today, I continued that fight for several hours in the morning until I finally, finally managed to get logged in as admin. And I was able to run a lot of diagnostics, and I was able to do disk checks, and I was able to verify that everything worked, and did some software upgrades, and I got the thing working what I thought was satisfactorily. And I didn't even log out. I just used fast user switching to switch over to a second account. I logged in as myself. Took longer than it should have, but it logged in. I got all my, you know, made sure my virtual machines worked, and all my software worked, and everything was good, and I was quite pleased. Performance was good. Uh, it was it was it was good. Typically, I don't turn the computer off at night. I log out, uh, but leave it on. So as I logged off, I got the infamous Mac screen of death. Not as famous as the Windows blue screen of death, but the Mac gray screen of foreign language death is equally as dire. And I got that as I logged off the computer. And so I was for it. And that locks it up. I mean, that when you get that one, it's done. You're done. So I had to power it off. And when I tried to log back on, it did the same thing again. It went into that long power up. So clearly, I'm going to have to 
managed to get into it one more time and do some emergency backups and nuke it from orbit because it's the only way to be sure. Fortunately, I work at home tomorrow, so I'm going to let it sit for a couple days, and Thursday I'll be back at it fresh and less frustrated. And that is it for today. We will see you again tomorrow. Remember, like, comment, and share. And don't point your finger at the camera, because it's big and blurry.